yeah. clearest memories, I think, yeah. were from Canada. So I just I saw, I just remember, you know, playing with my friends, basically, you know, but I don't actually remember came, coming from the Soto or anything like that. So for me, it was just like a fresh start, and then I started learning English quickly and everything. My mom worked a heck of a lot, and which meant that we were fairly independent. So if she wasn't lecturing or in the lab, um, we had to kind of fend for ourselves. Not in, not in a bad way, but um, like I learned how to cook and that was like the biggest thing in my life at the time. Um, I was like an adult now because I could cook and I could take care of people. He might look big now, but I used to take care of this one. No, um, but I helped out as well. Because I mean, I used to come home first with like a key around my, my, my neck and open up yeah. and you know. If I get a phone call, Machin is make rice, I tell her, and then that kind of thing. But it wasn't all you, you know what I'm saying? I think it was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I used to do is wake up in the morning, and while the children are sleeping at about 4 a.m., I would go and start my experiments. This is where the car story comes in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll break down like every couple of weeks, I tell you. I think she only she had like three used cars the whole time we were there. And two of them were Datsuns. The car had holes underneath. She could see the road on the ground as we were driving. <laughs> I was like, S -s slight hazard. The body was finished, that's the bottom line. But the engine, like Japanese cars, was still good. <laughs> nah, that car wasn't, it wasn't on. I wasn't trying to be a criminal. I want to tell the people out there, I wasn't. It was a mother frustrated trying to survive with no money on them. I don't know if you remember her ever owning a new car. She never had a new car. Going overseas just made me love who I am. Because you go into the media, it's all negative news about you. And you know where you come from. You know you're positive where you come from. I tell you, I don't know where they get naked people from, but you see them on TV, naked Africans. So people literally believe that if you're from Africa, you, where did you get, they just ask me, where did you get your jeans? In Toronto. I mean, obviously you never seen clothes until you got there. Maybe it was those days, maybe the media now has changed the way people look, but literally all you see are negative pictures, and you know better. So you begin to really love who you are. So I joined the African society, oh, full time. You know, I really began to appreciate Africa, and you, you, oh, it, it was life-changing for me. One of the things I often feel about African research is that we do not collaborate enough. I find that we're often sitting in our, in our little research groups doing our own research, but we can all go, to, go ahead so much further and faster if we, if we collaborate. So I'm quite impressed by the collaborative um, attempts um, that this work brings to bear. I saw on the internet that the CNRS, the institution, the government institution in France, launched a cooperation between France and South Africa. So I sent an email to Tebelo asking her if she's willing or not to collaborate with us uh, and try to do something together. And it works, and she said yes, and we started the collaboration. We are working on electrochemical sensors, uh, trying to find the best way to have very small electrodes that can be used in biological systems in order to